Portions of the following episode were recorded before a live audience. We recognize that some of the audio is muffled and we'll do better next time. But most of it is clear and the teacher's contributions are on fire. So please give us some grace and give it a listen. Welcome, I'm Dave. I'm John. And this is Teaching Like Ted Lasso. On February 25th, 2023, we facilitated a session at the Math and Action Conference on the campus of Grand Valley State University. The description for the session was, we started the Teaching Like Ted Lasso podcast because we believe in the rich connections we saw between teaching and the positive and popular Apple TV show. No knowledge of the show is required, just an interest in improving our teaching. Curious? Then please join us for this live episode where you are the special guests sharing what works for you. Welcome to Teaching Like Ted Lasso Live. We're excited to have you here. I can't see you there, but I know that we've got some folks here online and some folks there. I'm so grateful that on a, a day like today that you'd spend uh, your last little bit with us. Have you passed out the biscuits yet, John? We have not passed out the biscuits. Oh my gosh. Here I am worried about getting you on the screen. <laughs> You want to tell why you are remote? So I tested positive yesterday for for COVID, but we had committed to doing this, and we wanted to to share with with you all the work that we've been doing. Essentially, what we've been trying to do is take the ideas of Ted Lasso. Our goal was to find ten themes. And from those 10 themes, talk about what teachers are doing. So much like what Professor Gardner was talking about, it's not our intention to tell you all what to do, but instead to find out what you are doing and using Ted Lasso as a, uh, a framework to think about it. So we've got these five themes. We're halfway there. Play, curiosity, teamwork, vulnerability, and discourse. We felt like the timing was right that we could do this sort of like a, a retrospective of what we've been doing and share with you some of the the wisdom that some of in particular some of our guests and ask for your wisdom as well. Am I forgetting anything, John? Well, at least nothing that that uh, I can remember. So, and this really grows out of uh, Dave and I have been colleagues for twenty years. More yeah, than and this is what our offices are like two doors away from each other. And this is what we're like, right? We, you know, like, oh, have you seen this? And uh, oh, it made me think about that, right? So this really grew out of, uh, he was watching this show. At one point, he told me he just was not going to talk to me until I had seen it. <laughs> <laughs> and then he would check in weekly and then turn right around and walk out. But we love uh, kind of shared cultural experiences that we can relate to what we spend most of our time thinking about, right, with these people. I wanted to ask, just kind of, in, the familiarity with the show is not required to listen to the podcast. It's not like a deep dive into which writer wrote which joke. But I am curious, right? So if you could just show me from, like, zero fingers, I've never even heard of it, I'm just here because I heard there was soccer, uh, uh, to five fingers, like, oh, I've seen all the episodes. Right. And those of you who are online, you can put your answers, your responses in the chat, please. There are a couple fives. Uh, does somebody want to share the premise of the show? It's a British football team, a British soccer team, their football, that the owner essentially, like, at the very beginning wants to run the program into the ground, revengeful, and hires this American football, our version of football, coach to come over because she thinks that he's going to run it all into the ground and instead he is exactly what the team and the community always needed because he's awesome <laughs> <laughs> and i'm assuming the american coach that comes over is ted lasso yes yes okay. <laughs> so um and it started as like a joke ad campaign a network was going to be showing soccer games and they wanted some way to promote it the actor came up with this and his friends came up with this idea an American football coach trying to coach uh, British football. I think maybe based on some of the numbers that it might be worth showing that scene from the okay. show. TL, TL, LT presents a scene from season one, episode eight. Guys have underestimated me my entire life. And for years, I never understood why. 
it used to really bother me. But then one day I was driving my little boy to school and I saw this quote by Walt Whitman and it was painted on the wall there. It said, be curious, not judgmental. I like that. So I get back in my car and I'm driving to work and all of a sudden it hits me. All them fellows that used to belittle me, not a single one of them were curious. You know, they thought they had everything all figured out. So they judged everything and they judged everyone and I realized that they're underestimating me. Who I was had nothing to do with it. Because if they were curious, they would have asked questions. I do want to give you a couple seconds to turn to a neighbor, talk about the scene. If you have time, why would that remind you of teaching? Imagine a group of teachers playing around with ideas, curious about one another's efforts, discussing their practice, being vulnerable about what is and isn't working in their classrooms, and becoming smarter together. Any connections to teaching can come up in your groups? I just say we talked about how we want our kids to be curious, um, not just take things at face value to, to ask how and why. And That's something we want from our learners. Tiffany, we're going to start. I was going to pretty much say the same thing. If you can't explain the why of something, then I, I would say you can't really claim to know it that well. I think that's something that we try to see in our students, too, is we probe our students to show that they know something by explaining why, especially in math. It's, well, why did you do that? What was your thinking? Explain it. And so it's the same idea. If you can't explain it, then you didn't really know it in the first place. So it's our, it's our whole reason for being. One of the things that we do in the podcast is we try to connect, just like you did, what's going on in the show to what we think uh, effective teaching looks like. And some of that is, is pretty basic. And so we're going to start by listening to Andrew Otten. He was on one of our episodes about discourse. I start almost every day with some type of discourse about not math, uh, just to like get him started talking. Because I feel like if it's about math, about half the kids are already going to be checked out. So what we'd like you to do is give you a chance to think about a discourse question that's not math. What would you rather be, a lion or a panda? Let's start by, if you'd rather be a lion, roar. Can we have a couple of lions in the room? If, if you'd rather be a panda, make the sound of what? Munching bamboo. <laughs> So we have a room of mostly, mostly pandas here. Go ahead and do a, a quick turn and talk and talk to the, again, this is about discourse and trying to start by building relationship. One of the things that we like about Ted Lasso is that he's always asking uh, questions, just as that scene showed, he's curious. And so take a moment, and even though the people next to you might also be pandas or lions, take a moment to get to know one each, each other. What would you be? And why, why that? Yeah, what would you be and why? We try to ask our guests questions like that on a regular basis to get to know each other, but also just sort of this idea of having fun. If we were to think about these five themes, I was interested with Brett Gardner, Professor Brett Gardner, talking about these sort of core commitments. And so one of the things we try to have a chance for folks to talk about th these as their, those core commitments. So we, we have people on who might think about these as a little bit bigger. So one of uh, the first folks that we had on was Dr. Amy Noel Parks from Michigan State. And she shared with us a little bit about what was important from her research on play. What is play? Yeah, it's funny you say that um, after the panda lion question, because um, there are researchers who study play um, across mammals. So play is not just something that human beings do. It's something 
that at least most mammals do. I don't know about other animals. Um, so when lions are little, um, they play fight um, and they're like learning to do this thing they will later do as adults. So like play is it's stress free. It's not instrumental. It's done for pleasure. Um, but it is also um, in like an approximation often of um, something that will be done in a more serious way at another time. Robert Kaplinsky talked to us about the idea of being curious, not judgmental, especially around thinking about kids in foster care. And what do, does he as a former foster kid want teachers to know about that? None of our stories are comfortable to share. But the reality is, if we don't share this, who does? And if I could critique society at large, it's severely lacking in empathy. And I think that if people better understood other stories, you have much better understanding of where they're coming from. But who speaks for our foster youth? Like, who tells that story? And we kind of got to this point where, okay, it may not be our favorite experience, but if we're not going to say it, then we're basically okay condemning future generations of foster youth to having no one tell their story. So it'd almost be ridiculous for us to not share the story. So basically we were hoping to give teachers who were interested in hearing it, the perspective of what that experience of coming up as a foster youth must be like. Dr. Joy Osland, a professor here at Grand Valley, talked about her work with complex instruction and uh, how it related to teamwork. And the point is to be constantly teaching students and ourselves, that everyone in the room has something to learn and something to offer. That it's not about who's the smart one, but how are we all getting smarter together? Dr. Raj Shah talked about helping his pre-service teachers learn about vulnerability, and he actually used the, the DART scene. A thing that we crafted in our class, the, the methods class this semester was, because I showed them, be curious, not judgmental. You can't not show them the DART scene. Mm -hmm. And we started saying our class is a no judgment zone. And I think no judgment zone goes so well with vulnerability, right? Mm -hmm. Why we don't want to be vulnerable, vulnerable, we're afraid to be judged. We don't feel like we're strong enough to take the judgment and absorb it in a way that isn't painful, right, to ourselves. So if you can craft both of these things at the same time, they kind of fit. And then finally, Dr. Sam Otten from University of Missouri talked about his research on discourse. What I'm really looking for is kind of this attitude where the pace is a little bit of a slower pace to allow kind of, Andrew was talking about making the space conducive to conversation and give, giving room for that to come out. I think also the pace needs to be conducive for conversation to come out where we're not we're not rushing through something that's pre-planned. We actually have these moments where we want to just let things bubble up from the room. We want to actually pause and hear what other people's perspectives on it. And I feel like if the pace is too quick, students get the message that like, nope, we should kind of just button down, quiet, quiet up and let it sort of flow through. So I look for that pace where like, does this pace seem to let the discourse happen? And maybe that's what Andrew is doing with that first move of saying like, hey, I actually want you to talk. We're actually gonna make time and this is intentional that your voices should come in. So it, it's also sending a pace cue. So I look for that. I also look for the teacher having this mindset of being interested in like what the students actually might say. So it, it's asking a question that might have interesting answers or they might have different answers. And also the teacher with body language or with you know reactions or whatever it might be, the teacher to me kind of sets that tone of, I'm legitimately interested in what you might say and what you might say and what you might say in response to that. And so the pace and that sort of body language are to me like these signals. And then it's not like the discourse is great all the time, but I feel like if you have those things, it's around the corner, right around the corner, there's going to be some interesting ideas that come up or an interesting discussion that kind of comes up. That seems like a perfect spot then for us to, again, think about these five themes or again, to use Dr. Gardner's words, core commitment. So where do you see these core commitments in your practice? Which ones do you feel like are the ones that you could lean in on? Uh, we'll have a chance also to talk about pedagogical actions and what they might look like in practice. But just from a big picture perspective, which of these five do you feel like fit with your core commitments um, as an educator? 
go ahead and talk with each other or put your answers in the chat, please. Imagine a group of teachers playing around with ideas, curious about one another's efforts, discussing their practice, being vulnerable about what is and isn't working in their classrooms, and becoming smarter together. Great conversation. I always hate to interrupt. <laughs> yeah. Well, we want to, again, just like uh, Sam said, right, we want to make sure that we don't feel like the, the pace is our pace, but people's pace. But maybe are there people um, who'd be willing to share? We talked about how we've been doing a book study in our district surrounding strength-based mathematics and teaching, and it's a practice where you focus on students' strengths. What are the things that they're bringing to the table instead of always focusing on the deficits? in mathematics of they can't add, they can't multiply, focusing instead on what do they bring into the mathematics classroom. And we said that that ties into the vulnerability piece because when kids feel like what they're bringing to the table is valued, they feel more open and confident about speaking up. It also plays into the curiosity piece because kids who feel more confident feel better about asking questions and the teamwork piece, because then they begin to realize the value of working with others because they can see not just the strengths in themselves, but the strengths in their classmates as well. Yeah, that, that experience of finding these connections has been one of the, the most fun aspects of this for me. It's like, as we're talking to the different guests, it's like, oh, whoa, 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 Joey was just talking about this. And Andrew said, you know, if the connections between them are, are, are deep and I think meaningful. So each episode, we try to have um, multiple guests, right? One often talking about kind of big picture and one often talking from kind of the practitioner point of view, like, like what does this look like in a classroom? And one of our guests is the biscuit maker, Kathy, talking about play. And then in math, I just think if I, I have the, uh, a philosophy that games are to math as books are to reading, that kids just, they have to play the games in order to, you know, to, well, to give them a purpose, number one, and to be able to have fun while they're learning, it has to be, you know, something, um, if you want to learn something, it should be pleasurable. So they, they, the games give them that context as well. Uh, Mandy Danson, who was here as a keynote speaker last year and has her book on uh, rough draft math. You mentioned ungrading, and I know you do some of that in your own class. So what, how does that look in your class? Everything you do during the semester is an artifact of your thinking, mm -hmm. whether it's, you know, a reflection on a reading or a field placement assignment where you're understanding students thinking, you're getting different artifacts of your thinking all semester and you're tracking it. And then at midterm, at the end of the semester, they write a progress letter. They choose a couple of the big ideas and they articulate a claim. Here's what I used to think. And here's what I think now. And then they describe how their thinking changed. And then they bring in evidence from the class to show the tracking of their thinking over time. And they interpret that evidence to say, here's how I know that my thinking has grown and changed. And here's evidence of that. And then um, they do that for a couple of the different ideas. Then we conference and talk about it. Dan Anderson is a teacher from New York who has a lot of experience coaching as well. And he was talking specifically about teamwork aspects of building thinking classrooms. This thing for me was using standing whiteboards. So he calls it um, vertical non-permanent services, but standing whiteboards is really what it boils down to. Um, random grouping is, and those are the, the by far the most two important things. Um, my favorite thing is it just happened uh, yesterday in class um, where students, I asked them to solve a problem they've never seen before. It was like um, seven raised to the X equals eight raised the X plus two. It's like a exponential function is exponential function with different bases. So uh, the students came up with three different ways to solve it. It was fantastic. And we have never solved that before. They would get stuck, they'd try things. Um, it's funny because like one corner of the room, sort of, they all sort of worked together. So it was like two or three groups sort of working together. Like they were talking, they're working in their groups of two, but they're also talking to each other. So that corner solved it one way. And then other corner solved it, solved it a different way because they had gotten a different starting spot from some student. I don't know who that student was. Um, and so they sort of, then they could share with each other. Um, here's how I solved it. Oh, I like that better. You know what? When I go to the notebook, I'm going to write your way because I like your way better. Or I, they're going to stay with their way. 
Um, so have, tapping into that creativity is really, really um, a fun thing. Crystal Brommer is a teacher in Texas who also blogs about education stuff. And she was sharing from the point of view of vulnerability about students sharing mistakes. I recently ha had an article come out with Edutopia on taking snapshots and photos of students' work, their handwritten work. And I've been doing it for a long time and, and just now realized, hey, maybe I should write something about it. But before I can put a student's image of his work or her work up on the, you know, the smart board, Promethean board, whatever it is, I have to establish a culture in my classroom that we celebrate mistakes, that we honor each other. We don't laugh at each other. We don't ridicule each other. And that, that starts with me. That starts with me showing them my mistakes. And I'm very, if you, if you read the article, I'm very careful about which mistakes are actually shown on the board, nothing that would ever embarrass a student, uh, but something where they had a slight misconception and that slight misconception will help the class learn. And I, sure. I bring that in there and I say, I love that you made this mistake. I love that you thought that because now we're going to learn this way. Um, and that's why I decided to write the article. And then uh, we'll come back to Andrew Otten, who was uh, Sam's brother. So we talked to both of them at the same time. He's also working on kind of these building thinking classrooms sort of ideas. And he was thinking about the physical setup. How does that relate to what happens with this case? A couple of years ago, um, and they're all facing each other. The biggest thing is having them face each other um, instead of me. So they feel like they naturally have to talk to them, you know, because you're looking right at them. It's almost awkward not to say something, at least hello or something like that. So um, so I think the desk is, is the biggest thing that I have in my room that is a purposeful positioning for discourse and then getting them to talk about something not math related um, at first. I know you were just talking about these ideas as kind of big ideas related to teaching. But now to do that piece, kind of like Brett was suggesting about kind of once it's put into practice, can you think of a, an example from your classroom, a story that connects to your learners that relates to one of these things? So take a second to think, and then kind of once you're ready to share, go ahead and share with the neighbor. We'd love to have you share now. And the first week, we intentionally give them some questions that vary in ways to to go about it. And we don't we no longer say do the quadratic formula to find an answer, right? We give you this open ended uh, question with all these different ways to reach there, and the students struggle. I mean, major, right? It's no longer forced by them. It's more about what do I do, and I have. I'm very fortunate in my classroom. I have nine whiteboards uh, around the room. And so I'm very fortunate. So the first week I get groups of three up off of the building thinking classrooms, right? I get them up and it's, here's your open question, go. And I let them struggle. Like, I mean, there's significant struggle and they struggle for about 10 minutes. And I'd say, okay, if you need, please go borrow an idea. And the phrasing of borrow an idea is enough to spark because, and then I explained to them, borrowing doesn't mean you go look over somebody's shoulder and you steal their map, right? Borrowing means you have to be part of some sort of discussion and a why and a how, and then you bring that back. And I've had some groups of three that go borrow three different ideas and come back and go, wait, what? We have, but I saw this, that discourse then there really piques that curiosity, right? There's curiosity about why did this group choose this? Um, there's some vulnerability in having to go borrow, right? Um, and I find that most of my students that week say it's their actual favorite week of the entire year because it made them do something different than they've ever had to do before. Oh, I love that, sir. Anybody else want to share? Oh, I also shared an experience I had with this course. I teach in a bilingual classroom, so a discourse for our classroom can sometimes be a little bit more challenging than normal because they're also trying to use a language that they are not comfortable with. And so there's that vulnerability piece of not only might I make a mistake in math, but I'm also going to make this mistake in a different language and I'm going to get humiliated for that. And so one of the ways that I've kind of adapted that is I have table tents that are set out 
And I have one partner on one side who has a list of questions that they can ask related to the math class. And then the other one is some sentence starters. I don't give any of the answers within it though, but just some sentence starters to give them some language to use for the answer. And I found that a lot of students who didn't have an understanding of the mathematical concept, who couldn't really engage with the task before the discourse, after the discourse, they always get a chance to go back to the task. And after they had the discourse, they were able to engage a lot more in the task, simply because they had a chance to talk with others about it. But they wouldn't have had that ability to talk with others about it if they hadn't been given the mathematical language to do so. Yeah. All right. It's just so much good stuff to think about every example. Anybody else want to share? We kind of went off on a tangent, not of examples of these in our classroom, but of like roadblocks to them. And so we were talking about things like the space that you have to teach in or the, the furniture that has to live in that space or the class size and how much those factors that are so out of our control really make the ability for meaningful discourse or for more inquiry-based curiosity or play, that those are kind of roadblocks. Not that we can't overcome them, certainly, but kind of trying to balance the, like the things that we must exist with, with this kind of ideal world of where we wish that we were as educators. Uh -huh. So, Anybody else? There were a couple in the chat. Part of the goal of the podcast is to have this be teacher's voice, not our voice. And so... I'm wondering if, Marissa, would you mind sharing what you wrote in the chat? Yeah, so I mentioned a lot about in my classroom, the students, after quite a bit of time, have become more vulnerable. And now I have students who like are excited to come up to the board, and I teach with an iPad. And so they want to teach from this iPad, but part of that was we had to create a classroom in which kids felt vulnerable. Um, and they'll come up to the board and they'll explain it to the class. They'll actually act like the teacher. They'll ask the kids questions, the students questions. They know when they're coming up. Sometimes we make mistakes. I've made mistakes. They make them. But because we've created that culture as a class, they're really willing to do it. I love that. And I love that idea that teaching is a, an act of vulnerability. I don't think we give ourselves permission to accept that. That's really nice. So Ellen Rowe, when I ask a question in class, rather than calling on one person to answer, I have them discuss it with their table partner and then look for partners to share with class. Courtney, how about you? Is your microphone working? Can you share? Perfect. Um, I shared in the chat that I always start my classes with some sort of curiosity. So some sort of like connection to the outside world, something that they're doing already, but they don't really connect it to math or exploring math, what we're going to learn in some sort of way. So one of the things that we try to do in, in the podcast is we ask our guests to share, you know, where they get ideas. So kind of, Courtney, where do you get these ideas for outside questions? I don't know. Some of them are just kind of random. I definitely work with like my colleagues to kind of share different ideas, different ways that we like think of things and which helps like collaborate and kind of get our brains thinking like, oh, I didn't think about it that way. I use a lot of like things that I do in my life. So like recently um, I was doing fractions with sixth graders and I was like, oh my gosh, I was baking a cheesecake for the Super Bowl. Like, do they care what I brought to the Super Bowl? Not at all, but like they were more engaged because like it had happened the day before. So it was something more relatable and like I used it the day before so they could see that it really is used. Oh, I appreciate that. Thank you. It also reminds me that part of our discussion around vulnerability isn't thinking just necessary about vulnerability is bad stuff, right? Sometimes it's just showing up and sharing ourselves. So being willing to, to kind of share your, your authentic self with your students, that's great. And to Becky's point earlier, one of the other things that we talk about are those barriers on the, on the podcast. And, and space is one, definitely. Timing is another. I think uh, Professor Garner brought that up as well. Curriculum can be a problem. So again, we, we try to, we're think, trying to, to think about all of these different ways that we can support teachers. I think John and I both recognize that you all are already doing amazing things, right? We're not here to suggest that there are things, one more layer of things that you should be doing. Our goal is to get more and more teachers' voice out there. Some of the guests are people who contacted us and they're like, you know, I have something to share about this. 
it's not about us getting to yammer, although we do yammer at the beginning of every episode. <laughs> it's really about kind of finding people to share. So do you want to explain the grid? Yes. As you think about this session, if there were things that if we were to do this again, say at the end of 10 themes, what are the things that you'd want us to do? What should we continue to do? And that goes in the upper left-hand corner. That's that plus. The delta, probably the, the favorite for all of us mathematicians, is the change, a change that you would have us do the next time we did this. Bottom uh, lower left-hand corner, what ideas does this give you? And then questions, what questions might you have go in the, the bottom right hand? Something that appeared on the show is uh, one of the coaches at the meets who makes suggestion boxes. So uh, uh, Dave made a suggestion box. I don't think it was a niece or a grandkid. No, he did it himself. <laughs> it would have been easier if the grandkids had helped, I think. That was a hard job. And uh, the biscuits, one of the recurring bits on the show is that the football coach makes cookies for the owner. And uh, she doesn't want to have them, but they're just so delicious uh, that she's forced to, to eat these cookies. And uh, Kathy, I've heard just amazing things about these biscuits. All right. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. We appreciate everyone at Math in Action for supporting this episode. Look what I have. Oh, the suggestion box. All right. Yes. Improve the sound quality. The sound sucks. Improve the sound quality. If you're going to be on Zoom, make sure that your bedroom is clean. Yeah, too bad these are anonymous, huh? Uh, Kathy signed that one. Oh, here's one. Have more applicable ideas and resources to elementary classrooms. Here, take care of that one. Okay. And scene. <laughs>